Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, extraordinary TV and film actor, Taylor Nichols. And now, Rich Redman. What is up, rock and rollers? Yep, it's that time. Another exciting episode of the Rich Redmond Show coming to you from two cities. As always, my co-host, Jim McCarthy, joining us from South 65, south of Nashville, Tennessee. How you doing, buddy? What's going on? Almost in Alabama. <laughs> I know, but you get a yeah. lot of bang for your buck out there, man. I've been to your crib. It's nice. Yeah. Got the fire pit. I'm doing well. You're doing well, man. For the, you, Got you know, a nice this lawn. Is, it's the house that drums built, podcasting built, voiceover built. Radio. Radio, all that. What's yeah. your website? What are the folks for your voiceovers, buddy? Oh, jimmccarthyvoiceovers.com. That's jimmccarthyvoiceovers.com. Yeah, see? See why, see why we keep them around, guys? Thank and uh, let's just get some housekeeping out of the way. Usually we say this to the end of the show, but I just wanted to thank everyone out there. We're coming up on 80 episodes this is just something that was born out of one drunken evening with Jim and I, and we kind of built this thing with a little sweat equity, and you guys are loving it. We're talking to musicians, actors, comedians, thought leaders. We're having a blast. If you guys want to give us some praise, you got some criticism, I got an email address for you, the Rich Redmond Show at gmail.com. Jim, let's get into it because I don't want to keep this gentleman too long. He's important. He's busy. He's talented. He's a new friend brought to, uh, brought to my attention by, I mean, of course, I've seen him in my youth all over TV, all over the silver screen. But, but, our, but our friend Steve Cooper is like, oh, my God, you got to interview this guy. Um, he's a veteran of theater, TV, and the silver screen. My new friend, Taylor Nichols. <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> How you guys doing? Hey, it's so well, cool. I let the NBL games with the with the with the audience noise cracked in there. Yeah, man. I like I like the fireplace and the bookshelf there. It almost looks like a one of those faux backgrounds, like a preset yeah. zoom. Oh, it's uh, it's my living room. <laughs> Very nice, man. And and we we figured out that we're about a half a mile from each other, yeah. maybe a mile yeah. from each other. Yeah. We'd have to meet sometime and during safe. Um, uh, safer times when there's no zombies over at the little Starbucks. I don't know about you guys, Jim. I think Jim is a little bit less conservative than I've been, but it has taken me six months to go get my favorite thing in the world, iced coffee. Yeah, yeah. I've been afraid to do it. Like, I got like the hazmat suit and I'm undoing the, the straw and then I'm wiping and sanitizing the plastic and I've, right. it's, it, this is so old. So do you have to mask up for the interview here? Do you go with just the standard uh, edition blue well, medical I, mask? I, I went to pick up some dinner last night and I forgot my mask. And so the people where I was picking up the food gave me a mask and that's what they gave me. The yeah. Standard, you know, emergency room one or whatever. People are getting crazy. I mean, my mom was a nurse for like, you know, 40 years. They finally let her retire. Um, she threw in the towel and she's busier than ever, of course, but these things are high fashion now, these masks. I mean, people are, you know, putting zebra stripes on them and their well, I logos. I love the gold ones. I love the Dodger ones, you know, college mm -hmm. football. So We had a comedian, John Reap, on. He's kind of like a, kind of like a Southern comedian, you know. Uh, that thing got a Hemi in it. He was that guy uh, the, for all the Chevy commercials. And he's just got his face on. He's got like his lower portion of his face on the mask. Of his own face. Of his own face. Yeah. I want that. <laughs> I'm not his, mine. Right. I want to get one of my hand. <laughs> right. Let's See no evil. Hear, hear no evil. Yeah. <laughs> God, I hope this goes away. My God, it has been a very insane, challenging seven well, months. From, from what I'm hearing from the top, we've, we've rounded the corner. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. really? That's right. good, right? <laughs> Yeah, it just depends. You know, it's really funny. And you guys can we this could be a whole other rabbit rabbit hole. But you know, I've never been like a news guy. Like I've always been kind of a unicorn and rainbow guys like ignorance is bliss and uh, not watching the news, you know, and then in the last six months, I have watched more news than my entire yeah. life. And I don't know what's right. I think it's a sad Poison state of affairs where we don't know what is, what the truth. is real and what is the truth. Yeah, that's 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 disgusting, I think, because I'm, I'm the opposite of you, Rich. I'm a news guy. I was, yeah. a, I was a newspaper boy when I was a little kid, and I can remember sitting on the curb 
reading the headlines of the newspaper as I was, you know, taking them around to houses in the morning and stuff like that. Uh, so I've been kind of a news junkie all my life. Yeah. And I, I'm in the same place. I, you know, I hate to say it. The last thing before I go to bed, I'm reading the news. The first thing in the morning, I'm reading the news. And I don't think it's healthy. Yeah. I, I think you got to get it, you know, out of your system yeah. a little bit. Yeah. I worked in talk radio for four years and the best thing I did was get out of it. Yeah. 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 So. And talk radio, especially. Yeah. You know, um, well, Terry, I like that Terry spectrum. Gross. She's very, uh, she's very soothing. She's my favorite. <laughs> she's Is that so NPR? Smart. Yeah. Hey, I'm gonna open a window. Hang on. You got it. You got it. Hi, I'm Terry Gross. This yeah. is NPR, like that. Yeah, that's her. Oh, uh, she says she's always got guests on. They're usually, they're usually like more like from the classical realm, and it's deep, uh. deep stuff. Yeah. Oh, she's 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 a real national tre- treasure. You know, um, she's so. I haven't heard of her. Prepared. Oh, I, her show is called Fresh Air on, on NPR. And, uh, you know, she does politicians and athletes and entertainers, but also journalists and writers. I mean, it's yeah. just, I, I'm a big bike rider, Rich. I ride around West Hollywood, Hollywood all the time. And that's, that's what I listen to when I'm on my bike. <laughs> You know. Oh yeah, so so that's your thing. I just got back from like a six mile run. So like I've been like I'll do a as long as it's like it's it could be a just straight up walk, and I'll do all my phone calls. But right. at least I'm in nature, looking at the palm trees. I'm getting some vitamin D, and yeah. then sometimes I'll just straight up just go after a, like a run and turn on some like metal, angry music. So that's your thing. So it's like like the ten speed, not a mountain bike, a a ten speed. Well, I I ride all kinds of bikes, but yeah. uh, like. In the mornings, I'll ride, uh, you know, with spandex. I'm, I'm, I'm that guy you see in spandex. You're like you know? Paul Rudd, and and this is forty. Exactly right, which is. So <laughs> cool. uh, but but also then in the afternoon when I'm running my errands and shit, I I ride my other bike. Uh, I always like to tell the story. I I bought this bike. Uh, it's a Bianchi off of a drug dealer in Aspen, Colorado, in 1984. <laughs> oh, there's a lot of them there. Yeah. Yeah. So. Wow. Uh, but, but that's the bike I just ride around town and, you know, street clothes and, yeah. and all that. So have you gotten it, into the e-bike trend? That you know, thing I have happening? not, but, but a lot of, a lot of my friends have, and they, and they love yeah. it. It's a game changer, man. It really is. Yeah. It's like, well, I've ridden one once and I'm going, I could really get used to this and yeah. I, I would get no exercise whatsoever. <laughs> well, you'd be surprised. You, a lot of them, you, you have to keep pedaling. You have yeah. to pedal also. So. But some of them have the throttle. It's like a, it's like a moped. Yeah. You know? So when you mentioned Aspen, that kind of makes me think of, of your lineage because originally you're from Michigan, am I correct? Correct. Right. Yeah, that's right. And then East Lansing. Yeah. Michigan, Michigan yeah. State University, right? My so my, you, my brother went to school at uh, Thomas Cooley School of Law. Sure. Yeah, Lansing, yeah. Michigan, right? And we're, you were going to go into business, right? And you were thinking to yourself, I'm not doing this. Yeah. I, I my my mom taught at Michigan State and I grew up in East Lansing. And uh, I, I went to U of M across the state, University of Michigan. And uh, uh, I, I, I may have told Steve this story, but it's, it, it's such a depressing story. You know, someone said to me, you're going to be a great middle manager in a car company. <laughs> and I just thought, I just, I can't do that. So, now, so I actually, yeah. after I graduated college, I went to Aspen, Colorado, and I worked in a theater. And, uh, you know, I skied all day in the wintertime and rode my bike all day in the summertime. And then did the show at night. So it was really wonderful. So that's kind of where you got your tens of thousands of hours in, in the theaters there in Aspen, yeah. your, kind of your confidence. Yep, and, totally. and, 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 and I did, from listening, I learned so much from listening to that interview. It was a wonderful interview. You fancy yourself more of a New Yorker than a California guy, but you ended up out here, well, your first job was with James Garner. Yeah, very good. Tell us about that man. Um, that you know, I'm going to tell you, I, I don't know if your audience knows who he is or, or remembers yeah. him, but, you know, he was the Rockford Files. Sure. He's in, uh, uh, what's the famous movie about the escape from, you know, German prison? Uh, uh, oh, man. Stalag, Stalag 17 or? I, I watch Papillon all the time, with, but that's Papillon, a French, yeah. that's French. Yeah. Yeah, but it doesn't matter. But James, James Garner was a, a, a huge Maverick. movie star in the yeah. 50s and then a TV star in the 60s and 70s. And I, I worked with him in the 90s when he was kind of coming back on TV. And uh, there, there wasn't a, 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 a better person to start your career with than him. He was the most giving, gracious, uh, generous actor person you could imagine. 
I, I remember, you know, this is when you, when, you, when you get cast in a TV show as a regular, you have to do what's called a test. And you go to the network and you do the audition for, you know, all the people at the network. And so oftentimes when there's a star in the show, the star doesn't read with the other actors. And of mm. course, James Garner read with me and all that kind of stuff. And then when I was done with the audition, I was waiting. I, I was living in New York at the time and the audition was out here in L.A. And I was waiting for a taxi cab to take me back to the, you know, this is pre-Uber, pre-cell phone even, uh, uh, to take me back to the hotel. And was it James beeper Garner time? Walks, pardon? Was it beeper time? Pagers? Pre-beeper. Yeah, it was pager time. Ah, okay. Yeah, wow. yeah. Yeah. And I don't even think we had cell phones to get your pager. You had to go home. <laughs> they you know. didn't have car phones yet. <laughs> right. phone. Yeah. Uh, but, but Garner walks out of the room and says, you know, what are you doing? And I say, I'm waiting for a cab. And he says, here, I'll give you a ride. Wow. And he gave me a ride nice. home to the hotel. And you know, he was just, he was wonderful. I love people when they, when they can recognize young talent and they're not curmudgeon -y or, or, you know, been there, done that so much that they, you know, they're not going to help. The new but you generation. know from music, you know, that, that so many wonderful lessons are passed on by the previous masters, you know what yes. I mean? Yes. And then you own them, shape them to your own liking, and then you pass them on to someone else. For sure. So, so, so that kind of, he set the bar high, and you're like, wow, this Hollywood community is fantastic. Everyone's thick as thieves. And then I'm sure when you got your second job you, and your third job, you realize it's not all like this. Like so the lead actor and the director and the tone of the show is set by those individuals, and it's not always the, the, as inviting or warm. No, it's always, it, it's funny you say that because, and I'm sure, it's, again, it's the same in music. It's always set by by the leader of the group, by the yeah. leader of the band, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, you know, and if that person is gracious and, and confident, because that's usually what it is, it's, if they have confidence, then everybody else is free to do their best work. Sure. And if that person's not confident, then everyone's scared because the lead person is scared. It's so, it's so true. And, and yeah, those commonalities are there in music, you know, as a result of my relationship with my boss, Jason Aldean, I've been working with him for God, we've been working together for 21 years. I've been able to work with all these other recording artists. And you realize that all the recording artists like the Brian Adams or the Bob Seegers or the Ludacris or the Kelly Clarkson's of the world, they're at the top of their, the food chain and they have that confidence, but also that humility and that sense of community. It's usually the people that are in the middle that are stuck and are trying to get to that next level. They'll never get to the next level because of their horrendous people skills, their attitude. Did no, you find you're, that? You're yeah. exactly right. I, I think you're exactly right. It's the same thing in, in film and TV. The, the big stars are gracious and great and fun to work with and want you to be your best. Yeah. And the ones that are the B level or the C level are a little bit, they have a little chip on their shoulder, you know? Yeah. Have you ever worked true. with uh, Reed Diamond? We had our friend Reed Diamond on, a wonderful character actor. Sure, of course. I know. Who, no, I have not worked with him. No. And so he was talking similarly about, you know, how there's uh, some, you'll get with some actors that are scene stealers. that vibed. They'll, they'll vibe you or they'll try to literally, instead of having the truth of the scene and being committed to that moment, they'll actually try to shine brighter yeah. and diminish your right. performance. Yeah. You know, there was a very famous acting teacher, Roy London, yeah. who used to talk that way. He, he was very famous and he, he worked with Brad Pitt and a lot of really great actors. And I, I think he was a wonderful teacher, but I was always left with this, Thing that he would talk about about beating the other actor and i i sort of disagree with that and i and you know again i i make the analogy with music you know you you can't beat the other musician you have to work it's, with them yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, at the end of the day you're trying to serve the viewer exactly right? Yeah. Absolutely. And it's, uh, it's a concept I talk about a lot. I call it hashtag be them centric. It's not about you until it is about you. And then it right. still isn't about you. And then it still isn't about you. <laughs> Make it more about them. Make it, you know, what's right. in it for them. You know, yeah, you know there's a great, uh, I, I teach acting and. Uh, Where? I got to take your class. It's, it's a fun class. You would actually dig it. Uh, we have some good people. I, I teach at UCLA. Wow. Um, I also teach a private class here in L.A. And uh, I, I always have this feeling if, if, you know, Jim and I are in a scene together and when the scene's over, 
I say to you, Rich, I say, God, wasn't I great in that scene? Did, did you see me in that scene? Then the scene's probably not very good. Right. But if Jim and I do a scene and I say, God, did you see Jim when he kind of nodded his head and then swiveled in his chair? Wasn't he great? Then the scene's probably pretty good. Was. Because my focus isn't <laughs> me. My focus is on the him. other person. Right. This is why I not- wouldn't make a good actor. <laughs> That's the whole deal where it's like acting is 90% reacting and listening and being in that moment. And I love that because it gets you out of your head. It try to get out of our head, you know, in that conflict between the right brain and the left brain where you're, you know, your, your left brain, which, what, which, what is it? Which one is the super creative one? That's right. Right. I, I don't know. I think so. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I do so many, I read right. on this so much and I'm having a blank, but one side would be, you know, hitting your mark, framing, eye lines, memorizing your lines. And then the other one is where we really want to be, which is just letting it all go. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I studied with Leslie Kahn. Do you know her, Leslie Kahn? So so I've taken her comedy intensive. I've taken her drama and I've taken her scene study. And then, and now we're like for the last six months, I've been studying with her on zoom. And it's like for after six months, it was getting crazy where it was just these little avatars that looked like the Brady Bunch or Hollywood Squares, all of us talking. And this is so weird. You know, it, it's funny that you say that because it, it, if someone had asked me eight months ago, can you teach an acting class on Zoom? I would have gone, no way. Yeah. It, it's impossible. Are you doing but it? After, but yeah, but after mm-hmm. doing it for a while, it actually works pretty well because we, we interface with the camera. You know, so mm-hmm. when I'm looking at you, I'm looking almost directly at the camera. Right. So the audience sees the same thing that my partner sees, which is me looking at you. And yeah. that, that's... That's surprisingly effective. And Do I, I seem like I'm engaged because I'm not looking at the camera? No, no, you don't at all. In fact, I, <laughs> I thought you were on break for a while. <laughs> he's, he's going for the Howard Stern thing, which is the, which is the cocky side camera. Right, right. Is yeah. that cocky? Uh, not co- I mean, it's just kind of like, you know, look at me, don't look at me, okay? I'm not, I'm not looking right. at you. You see what I'm doing? See how important I am? No, but I mean, <laughs> you know it's who not, I'm be? This, this self-taping business is not going away. I mean, I actually got into acting at the tail end of going into a room. And I mean, I love going into the room and where the person's like, okay, it's a hosting job, Rich. It's a walk and talk. And I go and I go, I go, can you turn the font up like five times as large on the teleprompter? Cause I'm so old yeah. and they'll do it for you. You know, and you go in, you just Give me some it. binoculars. But now it's this like is- one word at uh, a <laughs> But now everything is self-taping and you've, you've really got to, you've got to have your ring light. You've got to have some good audio. You have they, know have they gotten into like on a script and from my reading of scripts over the years for various commercials and stuff like that in radio, everything was in capitals, right? Um, I believe every font has a voice. Does that make sense? You ever read a sign and hear a voice assigned like to the actual Helvetica sign? or Geneva have different yeah. personalities? Yeah. Hel- you know, like a, 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 a Geneva, yeah. New yeah. York Times, right? Impact, yeah. you know, and you know, uh, what was the other one? Um, uh, the, the movie trailer font that they always have. It's a uh, Trajan. It's called right. Trajan. Trajan. Wow. Font. Trajan font. It's got an epic type of sound, right. you know. In but a I mean, world it, long ago. Yeah, I mean, it, it, does anybody put, apply that to scripts now? You know, different fonts to convey how what the writers are thinking. Or mm. well, they they do do it with with italics. Italics okay, yeah. often means like an emphasis or something like that. But I, I've fonts. not seen it with different fonts. But I love that idea. Yeah, because yeah. I mean, all, I think all fonts have a voice. I mean, yeah. you know, we, I want to do a TikTok series of videos, and I keep on meaning to do this. I always forget because I'm getting old, uh, and just. Food signs, you know, Burger King sounds like Burger King. Right. McDonald's is like McDonald's. You know, you know what I mean? I don't know. Huh. I don't yeah. know. I don't know if I like the idea, Jim. Um, <laughs> I, I think on, it's a great man. idea. You have different characters speak in different fonts. That's right. You know? But I like think you do all character acting too. Very flowery. You know, yeah. Scripts. I mean, all fast food fast food restaurants. I mean, the the logos are all in orange, yellow, and red, which are the most striking colors. To the human and eye, which, food. yeah, it's like, look at yeah. me, look at me, look at me, look at me. Hamburger, ketchup, mustard. You know, yeah. that's true, yeah. isn't it? In and out burger, yeah. red and yellow, McDonald's, red and yellow. Yes. Well, you, you got a, a Culver's, which is out here. They're blue and white, which yeah. is interesting. Is there sc- yeah, uh, white, white Castle's blue and white. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Jim, have you had the in and out burger? Have you experienced that? 
I have. Uh, I got to be honest. I don't get it. I, I don't get I don't the French it. fries. I, I love the no. freshness of the burger, and I love how limited yeah. their menu is. They're just like, we do burgers. That's yeah. it. And, yeah. and of course, their business model is incredible because it's so fresh. It's clean. 24 hours a day, there's a Easy. line wrapped around ah. the building. Yeah. Yeah. But the fries like are soggy and crappy. Yeah. No, you, you, Chick-fil-A's you, you, got, yeah. You no, know, go ahead. Chick-fil-A does the same thing. Chick-fil-A does the same thing. I mean, it's, there's lines around the buildings out here. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was going to say you put In-N-Out burgers with, with McDonald's fries. Yeah. But, mm, uh, there you yeah, go. I could see that. That would be an amazing combination. So you have a, um, an anniversary that's happening this year, right? Isn't it the 30th anniversary of your film that you were in? Uh, Metropolitan. Metropolitan. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. How do you feel about that when you, when you can look back 30 years? I mean, that's creeping up on me, too. I just had my 50th birthday, went out to Joshua Tree, looked at the stars, banged on my drums like uh, McConaughey. It was a great time. But I, I'm thinking to myself, right. I remember when 30 was old, and then, God forbid, 40. 50, oh, yeah. my God. Then you're 50. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That was an early opportunity for you. I mean, that was a great opportunity early. Yeah, it was, it was my, it was my first movie, my first on, on screen job. Yeah. And, uh, I think had, had, had anyone asked me at the time what was going to come of that movie, yeah. I would have said nothing. You know, I, I didn't understand a lot of the humor in the movie really, even at the time I was so earnestly, uh, engaged in, you know, my character that I kind of missed the, the comedy which I think is what made the comedy work. You know, I yeah. think had, had I been trying to be funny, it wouldn't have been funny. Yeah, you didn't try to sell the joke. The joke just sold itself. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. which is what I've done all my career because I haven't understood any of the scripts that I've done. No, I'm teasing. <laughs> uh, um, it was really funny. We, we went to Sketchfest, which is a big festival in San Francisco every year. They did the 25th anniversary screening of Barcelona, the next movie I did with Whitstone. Yeah. And the 30th anniversary screening of Metropolitan. And we did that in January, February, right before the, the lockdown. Yeah. And uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's really been crazy how this pandemic, pan, pandemic has, has affected everything. I mean, it's affected your, yeah. your music career, I'm sure, right? Yeah. Everything I do, I do a little mo like motivational speaking and I teach. and Anything event-based. Anything it, that I do involves being in the room with some other person at the same time. Right. And my business went up. Yeah, exactly. Right. I <laughs> we have more podcast me. clients. Right. right. Shut up, Jim. Hey, you know, <laughs> it, it makes sense, right? Yeah. But mm. I mean, this is that, that, that's a major feather in your cap. And from that, so you did three films with wit. Is that correct? Um, I, I, I think I've done five. But oh, yeah, five. Yeah. yeah. I, I did three where I had, you know, Good roles. And the other two, I just had really, you know, small supporting, you know, little, little bits. Yeah. Um, it, it's funny. Whit, Whit told me a story. I, he and I are, are pretty good friends and have stayed friends for a long time. And this was after Damsels in Distress, the movie that he did with, with Greta Gerwig, which is such a wonderful film. Oh, yeah. So great. And I, I did a, a one day little part on that playing a teacher. And he and I were out to dinner you know, a, a year after that movie came out. And I said, you know, Whit, I, I don't think I should have done that role. You know, it's, I mean, it's not that I'm such a big actor. I'm above doing small roles. I do small roles all the time. And that whole thing they say about no small roles, only small actors is bullshit because there are small roles. Oh, sure. Right. But uh, uh, so I was kind of, you know, saying to Wit that I felt like I shouldn't have done this role. And he was so wonderful in what he said. He said, oh, no, you're, you're crazy. You know, making a movie is really hard and casting each role is really hard. And whenever you can cast someone that you know, trust, like, know they'll do a good job, it takes all this pressure off the day that that character is on the set. Yeah. And, and, and again, I'm sure it's similar to music when you're in the recording studio and you need someone to do the trombone that is not a big part of what you're doing, but it's a part of the sound. Yeah. You want the best trombonist you can get. Yeah. You don't, you don't yeah. seek out a mediocre trem, trombonist or whatever you, and if you had a buddy who was free that day, how great would it be? And so it, it really changed my attitude about those kinds of jobs and working with friends. Whenever you can do it, do it. And, well, I mean, yeah. do you have fun with it is a question. 
and and have fun with it exactly yeah oh, i mean um, it, yeah it's it's i mean for my creative pyramid the tetris that is my creative life um acting is 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 the whipped cream on my on my coconut cream pie and so if someone says you only have two lines and you're a doorman i'm gonna okay. just go and love the heck out of it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. You know, like, like this is Carlton, your doorman. Remember that guy from uh, <laughs> uh, the the Rhoda show? That, oh, that's all he ever said. <laughs> yeah, I do remember Rhoda. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I was Rhoda, I've been Rhoda emceeing, and it's this is something I don't need to do, but I've been emceeing a local haunted uh, forest kind of thing here locally. Yeah, and it's been going on all month. And it's not, it's not something I need to do. I don't need the money, really, whatever. I, I do it because, eh, okay, it's fun. You know, yeah. guy likes me and wants me to do it. And I guess I do a good job. And people get to see me doing my thing up there. And I, you know, I look like a zombie, you know, and all this fun stuff. But it's, yeah, it's, it's sure, you know, not exactly what you're doing. But I mean, it's, it's eh, you know, similar situation, I guess. But Very small. like a Halloween haunted forest kind of thing or what? Yeah. It's and called he's, Miller's he's Thrillers. zombie MC. Yeah, right. and I introduce all the, they've got jugglers and fire performers and all sorts of stuff happening while people are waiting in line. And is all that lines. open to the public? Is it, it's all, it's, it's running then, eh? It's outside. I mean, right. it's, oh, and okay. they all mask up and everyone's, you know, respectful. And Yeah. So the monsters are wearing masks? Well, the people coming to the, uh, you know, that are visiting. Yeah. Are interesting. Right. So Interesting. So what that's, what I've always wanted to know is, but I, I well, we can talk off camera about your class because it's time for me to start, you know, shaking things up and studying with some different folks. When do you guys meet? Well, um, I have two. We, yeah. we meet on Wednesday night nice. and we meet on Friday morning. And, and is it scene study or like uh, yeah, cold auditions? It's basically, or? Um, it's basically scene study. Uh, um, that that that's the ongoing part of the class. But I'm I'm a big believer in. I mean, I. I, I studied with a guy named Terry Schreiber in New York, and I also studied Meisner technique. Nice. And one of the great things about getting older and, you know, having worked in this business for a long time is, is you develop your own sense of what works. And it, you know, it, it may not work for you or it may not work for someone else, but it's worked for me. And so I'm taking what I learned from my different people, running it through my uh, sieve or whatever you call it. And then, putting it back out there. Sure. And so I, I believe a lot in exercises that are kind of um, uh, uh, in, in improvisational exercises. And that's the kind of work that I do when I'm getting ready to shoot something or to do a play is I, I, I sort of live in the character in my own voice, in my own world. And I, I, I say something that, you know, you, you sort of step through Taylor into the character. And right. so you bring as much of yourself as you can to the new role. And, uh, you know, I'm getting at that age where I'm an older white guy. So I'm starting to play creeps and, you know, perverts <laughs> and murderers and, you know, and embezzlers and all that kind of stuff. And while I don't have a lot in common with those characters, I don't focus on what I don't have in common with them, that I'm a drug addict or a bank robber or whatever. I focus on what I do have in common with them. I love mm -hmm. my children. Um, I'm, you know, you know, whatever, it, whatever it is. Yeah. So I, I like to start the scenes with an improv, and then out of the improv, let the scene go. Oh, so you start with improv. Interesting, because I, I had a teacher, um, a casting director, big casting director in in Nashville, and we would do the scene as is, and she says, do the scene again, and then drop the sides and continue in character as an improv to end the scene. Right. Also, also, except then it's too late to affect the scene. Ah, I mean, at least that time, you know, the, the next time it, it will affect the scene. But when the improv is before the scene, you, you really kind of relax into the work and into the words and into the relationship uh, so that when the scene actually starts, you're no longer thinking about what my lines are, wh where my mark is, yeah. you know, all that. So. Yeah. It, it's interesting. I, I have, and also what's great about zoom that again, I never thought would work is I can have students in Chicago. I have a student in London. Um, we, we used to meet at a, at a theater space on Willoughby and, 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 
and coal, if you can picture that. Yeah, it, okay. It's in Hollywood. It's right mm -hmm. near Gold's Gym in Hollywood. If you yep. know, everyone knows where Gold's Gym is, right? Yeah, yeah. Which has got to be suffering now. It's closed. It's been oh, closed so many of them have closed. Months. It's so sad, yeah. Yeah. But, I know. You guys, you guys are going to, the state's telling you how many people you can have for Thanksgiving. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Is that the case? Yeah. No, really. How many people you can have and how long they can stay. Oh, I, I haven't I haven't heard that. Is is that yeah. really a thing? It is. I saw the uh, I saw it on a news. I try not to watch the news like like you uh, or, or, or anybody, you know. I mean, I I just, I, I, just uh, I saw it it came across my feed and I'm like, "Really? Okay." Wow. But, you know, it's um has there been a a, a character that you've gotten into that's been difficult that has been successful? Like, what's the toughest actor or uh, character you've had to wrap your mind around? You know, it's funny. Uh, oftentimes, the toughest characters are the ones that are closest to home. Wow. Closest to me. Really? Yeah. Um, I, I, I played a horrible racist in the show Sleeper Cell a few years back. It was a, a, a Showtime show. Mm -hmm. And I remember, I remember thinking, oh, I'll never get this. I'll, I'll never be cast as this guy. I'll never get this. And, of course, I got it. And um, it's, it's amazing how that character fit me like a glove. And, you know, I, I, I honestly feel like Donald Trump, I'm the least worst racist person there is. Uh, <laughs> but it's really funny how oftentimes characters that are far away from your, your comfort zone are easier to get into. And characters that are really close to home are harder to get into. Um, huh. And I don't know why that is. Maybe it's just me that has that issue. Interesting. So I, I would say one of the most fun characters was this racist. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, do you go to craft on. service as the as the racist, or do you, or, or do you, or do you, can you come out of it and go have a granola bar and then go back, or are you more method? Uh, no, I'm able to come out of it. That's nice. Like that. I like you know, that. I'm, 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 I'm blanking on the actor's name, Ely, uh, early. Um, uh, he's, a, he's a famous actor, and I'm blanking on his, on his name. Um, he's he's African-American and was, was in the scene, was in Sleeper Cell. And it was really funny when he and I were working. I, I was really awful and saying some awful things to him and, mm -hmm. and all that. And he and I never talked the whole time we were shooting. And then when we were finished shooting, we gave each other a big hug and, and, uh, so was it kind of awkward around the common spaces and stuff? And yeah, it was a little bit when we, when we were shooting. Did and you, did I you do that on purpose to keep the tension? Yeah, I think so. I, I yeah. think that we both did. I think we both just kind of kept our space. We kind of just, was he kind of like, is this guy really like this? Or I mean, is he, I, you know, I don't know if he was or not. I don't, I don't think so. Uh, yeah. and he certainly wasn't after the fact. He was the most yeah. gracious, generous guy after the fact. Uh, so, yeah. Did yeah, you ever get, um, you know, Judy Greer, you know, the, the most workingest actress. Yeah. Oh my God. I think she's got such an interesting, um, you know, like yourself, the same thing, like a, like an extreme character actor where she could be the second lead in a million movies, but then she just does all these pop ons and it's been for what? 20, 25 years. She wrote a book. I don't know. What you know me from, Judy Greer? Uh, uh, it's the life of a character actress. Yeah. And so, do you do you have places and like do you get preferential treatment at certain restaurants? Do, do people recognize you here and there? At, at Trader Joe's. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which one? Do you go to the one on La Siena there? Then no, I go to the one on 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 Santa Monica. Okay, gotcha. You no, know, uh, uh, next to the lot, next to the the old uh, lot. Yeah, yeah. How many Trader Joe's do you guys have out there? There's so oh, many. So many. Yeah, there, in Vegas, there was a ton of them. We yeah. got one in Nashville. Yeah. It's a crime. But they're, but they're great stores. I, I, they are they awesome. Them, so. It's healthy. Yeah. It's laid out very well. The management style puffins. is great. It's great. Yeah. 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 And, the, and the prices, you know, you can't get beer and wine and liquor cheaper. Nope. Not, not yeah. that that's all I get there. <laughs> Two buck chuck. You can't go wrong. I think it's four buck chuck now, but still, hey. Is it four buck? Yeah. yeah. Those are cereal that they had that I used to eat was called puffins oh. and they were, they were the only ones who carried it. And it was like a buck 89, a box. Yeah. And you know, puffins. yeah. And they're good. Yeah. Yeah. They're yeah. natural. They're good for, well, you know, good for you. And uh, now like you can get them a Kroger for $5 a box. Yeah. It's freaking nuts. 
Yeah. What's Kroger, nuts. man? We we got Vons and Ralphs, man. Yeah. You have Rock uh, and Roll Ralphs. Do you ever go there? The, I have never been to the Rock and Ralphs, but uh, but the one on Beverly, you know, it's like. I've, I, if I just thought to myself, how many thousands of dollars have I spent over the years there? And when you think about it, food just turns to poop. We're playing, we're paying for poop, guys. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's that's a, that's a really negative way to look at no, it. No, it's not so negative because I, I enjoy yeah. the process of eating. But when you really sure think did. about it, if you want to be deep about it, so so look at these I titles. Enjoy, enjoy the process of pooping, but we won't go into uh, that. Yeah, I mean, I think any I think any guy over thirty five just revels in this. Just it's our time. Yeah. I'm re I'm working on the Lord of the Rings, War and Peace, and the Bible. Leave me alone. That's right. So, so, I, do all, <laughs> so I do my reading. Right. You know what, Courtney just got me. Courtney's my wife, Taylor. Yeah. Uh, she's a great. She's bought for our bathroom. A timer. A squatty <laughs> potty. A what? Oh, I got the time. I got the timer for Christmas for my kids yeah, because yeah. they didn't want me sitting on the toilet before they get the open presents. But uh, a squatty potty. You ever see those? Oh, yes, I have. Yeah. And it works. I mean, you know, <laughs> I've dropped like five pounds. <laughs> you know, a, a, uh, this episode yeah, brought to you by Squatty married. Potty. A friend of mine got married, Jim, and he and that was on their wedding. Uh, <laughs> On their wedding um, gift. Oh, my God. Registry. <laughs> Done. On their wedding <laughs> register. A squatty potty. And, and I should have fucking bought it for them. <laughs> oh, my God. I'll buy, I'll buy it for every bathroom in the house. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe where this went. But now I'm thinking, like, we're in, the, in, in true, like, Judy Greer fashion, these are some of these other incredible things you've been part of. Boiler Room, I love that. Congo. The American President, The Big Easy, Jurassic Park Three, and then when you get on TV, you're 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 a bit player or you're a walk on for Murder She Wrote, News Radio, Chicago Hope, ER, Judging Amy, on and on. CS, of course, all the CSI, Criminal Minds, The Mentalist, but then you had a big part in a Mike Binder show, right? The Mind of the yeah, Married yeah. Man. Re really, a really a wonderful show. Mike was great. Was I remember watching it, and and I'm here I am talking man. to you all these years later. Life is so cool. Yeah. You know, that, that was a fun show because Mike comes from the world of stand-up comedy. And so he brought in as guest actors, but also just, you know, comedians would just show up on the set. And when, we're, when we were at lunchtime, we'd all be standing around. And standing in a group of comedians is weird because they are just throwing it out there left and right, just seeing yeah. what sticks. And if it doesn't stick, they move on. And they just, it's it's. It was really fun. It was a yeah. fun show to do. And, uh, Except it aired on, uh, it premiered on 9 11. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And no one wanted to see a show about a guy who wants to cheat on his beautiful wife. Yeah, it's like, you what do you, you got everything, person. buddy. You want to cheat on that? What? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, I got to ask for Boiler Room. <clears throat> Were you one of the salesman roles? I'm, I'm apologizing. No, I was the mark. Uh, okay. I was the guy that uh, Giovanni Rubisi's character, uh, you know, the whole thing was about, you know, bogus stocks. And he, he sells me bogus stock. I and then at the end of the movie, I show up to uh, kill him. And, oh. uh, and, and that's kind of how the movie goes. But, nice. you know, that was really a fun, a fun movie. Ben, ben Affleck was in that. And he, he was just be, becoming a, a star. A name uh, at that point. That. Yeah. And I remember... Um, when he showed up to shoot one of his big scenes, he was rock solid, word perfect. It was, it, it was really great. You know, this guy could have easily phoned it in a little bit because here was this yeah. kind of small movie and he was a big star. <clears throat> and yeah. he, he did the opposite. Yeah. He, he's a class act I've always heard. And yeah. when I lived in Vegas, he would uh, frequent the tables. Uh, I think back when he was dating J-Lo, and she used to kind of get him on, get him, get on him for doing this. But he would tip the dealers huge. Yeah. I mean, thousands of dollars huge when he would leave. Just a yeah. you know, just a sweetheart of a guy. I uh, I think uh, Ben Ben Younger was the writer director of Boy the Room, and Ben told me that Ben Affleck gave him the writer director Ben Younger a Harley Davidson yeah. as a gift for the for the movie. Just a giving guy, you know. Say they say money amplifies who you are, so yeah. it's just very interesting. Yeah, he's always a, he was always on TMZ for tipping uh, a restaurant valet a hundred bucks every time. I guess when you're a celebrity like that, you know, one of our one dollar bills is their hundred dollar bill. Yeah. You know? yeah. So 
<laughs> the Rich Redman Show will be right back. Henry Ford once said that if you need a machine and don't buy it, then you will ultimately find that you have paid for it and don't have it. Nothing could be truer about energy-efficient LED lighting in your business. At Big Dot Lighting, we can show you how a portion of your savings from a commercial LED lighting upgrade will be paid for in hardly any time at all. Until then, you're paying for them anyway. Book a no-cost lighting energy assessment with Big Dot Lighting. At least 30% of your utility bill is waiting to be saved. Go to BigDotLighting.com. This is The Rich Redman Show. There's another show that you're on Hulu with Maya Erskine, Pen15, and if you look at it, it looks like penis. Right. And it's it's <laughs> it it's does. actually two 32-year-old mm-hmm. comedians playing 13-year-olds, but they're they look youthful enough that it's it's hilarious. It works. Yeah. Well, they're they're Anna Anna Conkle and and Maya Erskine are the two writer director. I mean, writer creators of the show and the stars of the show, and they're both really funny. They're both. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, they, they slouch and they kind of, you know, uh, they, they bind their, their boobs and they wear funny haircuts and, and they, they really look like they're 13, except all the other kids in the show really are 13. Oh, um, God, that's crazy. It's, it's, it's hysterical. It's really funny. It's been a pleasure <laughs> to be involved in the show. And so but, you're going to be on season two as well, yeah? Well, season two just, just, just dropped, as they say. Okay. Uh, oh. Not to be confused with our earlier but, conversation yeah and uh, uh uh but now we're on a little hiatus because anna's pregnant and so oh, and, wow. your daughter's pregnant but. so maya is the daughter of the famous jazz drummer peter erskine so peter right. teaches at usc right. and he was in weather report and the Maynard ferguson band and now he just does session work at, at Capitol records and plays on like family guy Right, you know, right. and that's her dad. It's just crazy. Yeah. He's, he's really the nicest guy too. He he come he has come to the set many times. Yeah, and he's so unassuming, and you wouldn't yeah. know that he's like this rock star. He looks, he, he looks like a CPA. Yeah, <laughs> he does. Yeah, yeah, he does. And what's funny is also Rick Karn is the actor who plays him in the show, and Rick uh-huh. Karn is the guy from. Home Improvement. All those years on Home Improvement with. Oh um, uh, yeah. Uh, wait a minute. That, that that is so it's kind of there's a peter erskine character yeah the father well, there's, yeah there's uh uh yeah uh-huh. and he, he he plays a drummer in the in the show what okay because i've only seen the first two episodes which tells me i gotta dig deep i gotta go and really explore this but what's great is rick Karn and i are old friends from when we lived in new york yeah and now we're working together on this show playing the two fathers so Oh my God, that's crazy! And so you you're you said you're a fan of music. Do you do you play an instrument? You know, God, I don't. I've been learning. You know, when uh, and I don't want to get political, but when Trump became president, I got tired of getting sucked down the news, you know, rabbit hole oh, of all sure. that stuff. So I started playing the guitar, nice. and it's hard. No, it's not nice. It's not terrible. <laughs> and my wife is you know going to kill me, uh, and and I just got an amp. So now I'm like. <laughs> Hey, if, if Mark Marin can do it, you could do it. I mean, he just he knows three chords and he just yeah. cranks it up. Yeah, that, that's what I do. I know I know more than three three chords, yeah. but uh, maybe five. No, but uh, but I'm I'm having fun, and it has opened up this whole door of respect for people that I just didn't know about. Yeah. You know, when I was growing up, you know, I, I got my my start in theater, and when I was young, I did musical theater. So while, uh, while all my friends were into, you know, Pink Floyd and whatever, I was into, you know, 42nd Street. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but you were singing. You were singing. You could match pitch yeah. and no me yeah. about oh, yeah. melody. I'm, and, I'm a musician in the sense that I can match pitch and yeah. sing, but I can't play anything. I mean, yeah. Except for now I'm learning. I'm not a big musicals guy. You know what I mean? Like Cats yeah, you, and... You played uh, Dear Evan Hansen. I mean, that was good. Oh, yeah. G- Jim... Um, Jim created this kind of like... Uh, Brought you to tears. It is a nice song. It was a song from Dear Evan Hansen called Waiting for a Window, and he wanted me to shoot a video of, of, of showing how a session drummer hears a song for the first time, writes it out, and then can get a first take of it. Because that's pretty much how I've made my living the last 20 wow. years is being a session drummer and then going and taking the music to the people and entertaining them on Thursday and Friday and Saturday nights. And so this yeah. is actually the first time in... 
16 years that I've had six months off. I wow. mean, wow. it's very, it's been very strange. So where know? would you play on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday night? Well, we play mostly um, amphitheaters, arenas, and stadiums. Right. Oh, wow. But, but right. when we were starting out, we were playing, you know, rock and roll nightclubs with the, with the trough that you pee in in the bathroom, you know, sure, yeah, and yeah. you're peeing next to the guy. And he's like, good job on the drums, man. He wants to shake your hand. <laughs> and you're like, nah. And you're like, uh, let's wash our hands first. Yeah, yeah. Um, but no, it, it uh, Jim, Jim can tell you, it took about 20 years to, of nonstop touring to get to the point where you could be headlining um, an arena. So you can, you can hear a song once and pretty know and pretty much know what the drum pretty much you, you just he I, writes think it out. I think it's similar from the acting thing is like i read music so i'm like overtrained because i played classical you know percussion and i got my master's degree in that and played a lot of big band jazz and 20th wow. century avant-garde music so then when you learn all these techniques and you've got you go into the studio and you've got to record five songs in three hours you've got about 35 minutes a song to hear it know what you're going to do, which is a combination of knowledge, experience, time in the trenches and, and, and executing it. And, right. and then and instinct, so, right, yeah. and instinct. And so, and, and there's, there's something similar in the sense that uh, in the drumming world, sometimes I'll be going into a recording studio and the drums are delivered at nine o'clock. And I talk to the engineer, we have our coffee. What's up? We get drum sounds. The band shows up. Then the artist comes up. I've never met the artist before. I have to meet them find commonality with them, give them what they want, provide a service. And the little couple acting jobs that I've done where it was like, okay, you're doing, you're playing the part of a DJ in this horror film that's going to be on Netflix. Right. I go in, I sit in the makeup chair, I get the makeup, I get my side, someone hands me an iced coffee. I'm meeting the actresses for the first time. We did it three times. That's a wrap for Mr. Redmond. And then the crew's clapping and you're like, I can do this every day. Yeah, yeah, totally. I, I would love to do this every day. But I think every actor wants to do it every day. Totally, yeah. And, and really, that, that's where it gets fun, you know. Yeah. Uh, although uh, I, I often say to my students, um, Moses Malone, the, the famous basketball player, had a great quote that uh, being a professional is doing what you love to do on days you don't want to do it. No, oh, which, wow. which is a pretty good way of, of looking. Makes sense. Yeah. I love playing basketball, but you know, six days in a row, yeah. I'm sore. Or you know, I love acting, but waking up at you know four thirty every morning or five every morning gets tough after a while. But, so, well, you know, you're 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 we're all kind of similar, similarly aged. You're getting to the point where you can maybe write a memoir if you were going to do that. What, what, is there some stories that, that really stick out to you that are incredibly memorable or where you, you uh, mind uh, some wisdom nuggets from a situation? You know, you know, the wisdom nugget that I would, I mean, first of all, I would write a book similar to Judy Greer's in the sense that, uh, you know, God, did I go to high school with you? Yeah. Is, where is have I seen character? you before? <laughs> um, Do I know the you? Only, the only difference there is, is I, I have done a few projects that really stick out in people's minds. Yeah. And so it's always interesting to see which person recognizes me from which projects, you know, uh, 30, 30 year old guys, you know, who live in Chicago, New York, or whatever, love boiler room, because that was a big movie when they were younger or whatever. Um, a little bit older people from the East coast love the Whit Stillman movies, you know, comedians and, and, and that crowd loves the mind of the married man. Um, now younger people are, are talking about, uh, uh, pen 15. So it's funny how, Different audiences pick up on different things, but the one, the one, uh, someone's calling you right now for a gig. Yeah. Man. Yeah. Yeah. It's text. But, uh, the one lesson that I've really learned is you got to keep going. Yeah. You just, I mean, it, I hate to say it and I know everyone says that, but there are so many ups and downs and especially when you've been doing it 30 years, you know, sometimes the ups and downs are a year or two. I, I remember I, 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 I've worked with Laura Linney, the actress Laura Linney, who's yeah. just, you know, dynamite. She's, she's the, the wife in Ozark now. But, you know, yeah. she's, she's been hitting it out of the park on Broadway and on film and everything for decades. And I've worked with her a bunch of times and we became friends a little bit earlier. And I, I worked with her, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago. And she, she said to me, you know, I hadn't worked in a year. And for Laura Linney to not work for a year, it's like, what the fuck? She can do yeah. anything. You know, she can 
walk onto a Broadway stage and hit a home run. And, and you know, I, I, I just think that those ups and downs are everywhere. And I know they're in music and okay. in, in podcasting too, Jim, I'm sure it's just, you know, oh, voiceover for sure. Voiceovers. Right. And yeah. it's, the lesson is do what you love and do it because you love it. Yeah. And Good don't method. worry about all the other stuff because yeah. there are, and I'm sure that Brad Pitt has ups and downs. I'm, you know, I'm, I don't know, but I'm sure he does. Well, I remember it. Yeah. In the early days, I think someone said, my God, you're gorgeous, but you really need to take classes. Yeah. And, yeah. and so he got him his butt in classes and it, and it evened everything out. But that's uh, what a great resource for your students. They're studying with you. Not only can you share the, the hard earned techniques, but you could probably kind of like spoon feed them some uh, acting career advice. Like, Absolutely. what do you do if you're not working for a year? Well, right. you got to keep your mental and physical sharpness together, get your exercise, stay positive, maybe go do some plays, do take some classes, stay yeah. sharp. Yeah. That, you know, that's, that's exactly the same kind of, you know, advice I, I talk about. Uh, and, and one of the nice things about my class is we do do a lot of that. It's not a business class, but there's a lot of business in the work yeah. because you have to navigate, you know, it ain't show art as they always say, you know, it's show business and you have to navigate yeah. that. You have to be able to play the game and the game changes now with social media and podcasts and all that stuff. It and a lot of it is selling. And it's some, I, I kind of coach people, creatives mostly, on how to package themselves and sell themselves, you know, right. in an active environment, you know, that there's a process to it, that there's a, a uh, fundamental way road to the sale to get you to the goal line right. in almost anything that you do. See, now and that's the kind of, of class I could use, you know. Yeah. But I mean, you know, you've been very successful in your own right doing what you do, uh, you know, because what are agents? Agents are professional salespeople. Yeah. For, 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 ta for creative talent. Sure. I mean, that makes me think that the average, it seems like the average actor in the course of their career has at least two managers and probably three or four agents. And there's, there's a, I'm always surprised when I listen to an interview with an actor that I says, I have the same agent that I started with. Right, right. Have you been able to do that or did you make uh, a couple I, of changes? I, I've had two. I, yeah. I, I was with one agent, Harry Abrams, for a long time. Yeah. And then I switched to uh, Sue, Sue Wall and Darlene Kaplan at TalentWorks. And uh, um, I, I, it's funny because I, I have always wanted to have sort of one agent. Um, and Harry uh, was a wonderful agent. And I love the agency. But I got to a point where I wasn't having the career that I wanted or that I thought I should be having. And I said to myself, I, I can't stay with the same agent all my life if I'm not having the career that I think I am, am capable of having. Sure. So I, I made a change. And my career didn't necessarily change drastically one way or the other, but at least I knew that I was taking control of my own destiny by making the, making the change. And yeah. uh, ultimately, I think it's been good. Nice. Fantastic. It's yeah. tough to do follow-up calls in the acting world. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I just want to follow up with you and see about the pitch I made to you the other day about that role. I uh, just want to get your thoughts. Is there anything else I could do for you about that? Yeah. Are we ready to make yeah, a decision? Yeah. Or? It's so funny because my, my wife says, you know, hey, you should call them. You, know, you, you had this great audition for this job. You should call them. And I'm like, yeah. I'm quite certain they will call me if yeah. they want no news is no news. No news yeah. is no news. You just go in and voice. Yeah, you I just, just I just auditioned for a pretty sizable voiceover gig, and I do make it a point to reach out to the agent and say, "Hey, I understand. I don't want to, you know, put anything on you, but if you know, what, do you need anything else from me?" for this because i really feel like i've kind of hit on it and everything and they're typically appreciative if uh, if you reach out and it's succinct and you're all you're bringing something to them of value right. of uh you know no matter what i want to make sure i make you look good right there you go that's yeah. what i want to do yeah i i often say to students you have to sell yourself to the people who sell you that's sales well, yeah yeah it's selling 101 and in general yeah. And I, I worked in the car business for a couple of years. That's what I did. I sold me first, then the car, then the dealership. That, that had to be a tough job. Uh, but it's like anything else, you know, like what you were talking about, that you have your ups and downs. You want to talk about a business that's got ups and downs uh, where your back is against the wall, of course. Um, but, and I just told this story earlier today. I had a friend of mine who uh, 
probably about 20 years my senior, he and I became really good friends when I worked for this Mercedes dealership. Uh, he saw me, I had a desk right by the door. He comes walking in, he sees me just like, you know, my, my hair's on fire. I'm ready to friggin' just throw the phone through the wall. And he goes, what's going on? I said, I got this going on. Blah, 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 blah. And he's looked at me. He's like, Jim, it's always something. <laughs> and I'm like, that is so true. Yeah. That is so amazingly true. Thank you for telling me that. Cause ever since I, st- I realized that life's just easier. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's always, it's always something. something. It is true. And you can kind of like, you do want to, you know, you don't want to be lazy. You want to put in the effort, but at some point you have to say to yourself, God, if there is some sort of higher power out there, I cannot do this all myself. Right. Yeah. This is and way too hard. Yeah, you can. You need it. You need a team. Yeah. 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 And you know what, what Jim was just saying about calling the agent, you know, sometimes the squeaky wheel gets a little grease. But yeah. bring something to them. You know, uh, yeah. it's like every time your phone rings and somebody you see somebody's name, you're either going to go, oh, or you're going to go, ooh, what do they got for me? Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And if you're that guy and you have that mindset going into it, I always want to be that guy that I've got something Ooh, for you. Right. I'm calling you for a reason. Yep. You know, yeah, I'm not just calling you to touch base or follow up or, you right. know. Well, know. Jim, you got out of the car business before you got to middle management. So, yeah. didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Am I in middle management now? Is that what I do? No, you, you were, but you were on the way to middle management in the, yeah. in the car. On the street. way to middle management. That's right. I, I don't know about that. I mean, I, I did very well. I really enjoyed the brand. I fell in love with the brand, but it was a, yeah, it's a rough business, especially when you're working for a dealership that doesn't look out for you. So that's, yeah. that's the scenario I had. That's what well, I well, talk about a business, uh, you know, Hollywood and uh, mm-hmm. a, a business where no one is looking out for you, even if they say that That's you true. are. Right. I yeah. mean, to, to, to have survived over three decades and, and, and made money from your craft and bought a home and raised a family and, and infected three generations of people that have seen you in comedies and dramas. Uh, that is an amazing accomplishment. Thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> that, you know, I got to tell you, that, that's nice to... That's nice to hear. I, I, have, I, have, I have two kids in college and yeah. you know, I, I'm, I'm, in the, I'm in the pit, man. I'm, I'm, yeah. digging, I'm digging holes, you know. Well, also keeping marriages, keeping a marriage, I'm, you know, I was married twice, you know, and it's not for the faint of heart when you're in the entertainment business. You know, I got married for the second time when I was like 38 or 39 years old and I got my new wife a cat and I was like building this brand of this entertainer that I'm in and we were gone two Hundred and ninety days a year, wow. and that's just hard. Yeah, you can't you know? do that. That's that's really tough. That's just hard. You know, we we just dropped our our youngest daughter off at uh, U, UCSB uh, Santa Barbara, and my wife and I uh, drove around drove across the country, and we, and she she called it our our victory lap. You know, it's like we <laughs> we, we did it, done. man. We, yeah. we fucking did it. So. Yeah. Now, and, what is he had never done a, a, a road trip, so it was. Really what does your bride do? Is she in the arts? No, no, she's a translator. She's a, she's Spanish. I I met her when I was in in Barcelona, Spain, between uh, Barcelona. Yeah, that's amazing. Nice. And uh, we we just hit it off. We started hanging out together, and uh, then we did the whole cross world dating thing for a while. Oh wow! And then hmm. then then she came here. I was actually in New York, and and I was doing a movie in New York. She came to New York, and we spent about. Two, two, three months in New York and, you know, totally dug that. And then we got married and then we had a yeah. kid. And we had yeah, did, kid. did you pick up some Spanish? Can you speak Spanish? Or, yeah? You know, it's really awful. I, yes, I can speak yeah. Spanish. But yeah. no, I, you know, you and I can, can converse a little bit, but no, it's really awful. You know, she, she's a linguist. And so she speaks, you know, Italian, French, Catalan, Spanish, wow. English. And she always spoke English. So, you know, whenever I would go K, as in what, she would just switch to English. So that's, that's my excuse for not speaking better Spanish. Ah. That, that she doesn't want me to. You don't Man. speak any other languages, do you, Rich? I, I you know, I, uh, I have that Rosetta Stone. I really, I think that if you're going to learn a second language in this world, is Spanish is the way to go. Yeah. I, you and know, I, here's a, here's I just a feel like I have an aging idea. brain. I just had an amazing idea. What? What is it? A, a, an accent training type of thing like a Rosetta Stone. For Remember actors? we were talking to Reed? Yeah, for actors. Remember we were talking to Reed and he basically talked about uh, having to learn a German 
you know, dialect That's accent. Dialect, sure, accent. Overnight, uh, overnight. Overnight. Yeah. Yeah. And he watched YouTube oh. videos. Yeah, so he watched like Hogan's Heroes. <laughs> <laughs> he basically, that's what he did. And I'm going, that's a talent, man. Right, right. Because right. my, my British accent is awful. Yeah. Well, because then, you, have, then you have Cockney and you have, you know, all the different regions yeah. and it's like, wow. Yeah. I had a client one time, do a British accent on it. I said, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll try it out. <laughs> okay. You know, so, I've so taken more than 1,700 of the questions on my site and put them into this random. Uh, and my, we had a guy living with us from England at the time. And he heard me doing this. He goes, I opened my door and he was like, literally right there. Yeah, go, he's like, what were you doing? I go, <laughs> uh, I, they wanted me to read it with a British accent. He goes, don't ever do that again. That was terrible. I said, I know, but they like it. I, I don't Did know he help why. You I mean, Did he help you? He he just laughed at me. I mean, he, he was from Wales, so he had a very different accent. Well, general. you sounded like the leprechaun from the movie Troll starring <sighs> Jennifer awful. Aniston. That was her That's first awful. big role before she got friends. I know the roles. I know the accents I can do. No, it was I'm called Leprechaun. It was called Leprechaun. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Crazy. It was awful. Well, you know what? I, I have learned so much, man, and I'm just I'm so happy for you. Congratulations on this 30-year anniversary that kicked off your whole career there. And yeah. we're neighbors, so when it gets safe to get together, we'll have to get together. I and um, how do you like to be found on the uh, interweb? How can people Wait, find I got a random question here. Oh, okay? that's true. But where can we find question, you, Joe? Random question, random question of the day. Don't yeah. cut me out, no, pal. That's right. We paid for that jingle, too. My good friend Jeremy wrote that jingle, so we better use it. Yeah. Okay. Taylor, random question of the show. Here we go. Okay. What game do you always lose? Strip poker is, is like the answer you're supposed to give. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, I got to tell you, I, gambling, gambling in general, I always lose. A lot of people uh, do. I, you know, I, I'm not a big 21 player. I, I liked craps. Uh, but every, whenever there's money on the, on the table, I lose. Of course. So I just like, don't, yeah, me and the stock market. I just market. don't do it anymore. I just yeah. don't do it anymore. When, it, when, I, when I see those stories about, like, Michael Jordan losing, you know, millions of dollars, I'm like, oh, God, how could he do that? But, uh, there was a guy one night. We were waiting outside. I think we were in the Bellagio. We were outside the bathrooms just – you know, everybody was going to the bathroom and there was a guy there. And mind you, I was in radio at the time making $25,000 a year. And he was feeding into the slot machine, uh, $1,000 bills. Oh, no. And it's like, gone, gone. I'm like, dude, <laughs> come on. What are you doing? Yeah. I don't know about that. You know, I, 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 did a, I did a show called Sugar Babies, which was a, like a Broadway musical. And we did a tour and the tour ended in uh, Tahoe, in Harris Casino in Tahoe for like four months. And I, I, I realized that nobody wins in, in those things. I mean, no. even no, the people it. who win don't, don't win. So When we would have people visit us, we won. Yeah. So my wife and I would always be up and we knew enough to cash out. So her, her brothers came in to visit us. We would go play, you know, we'd always play the mega bucks because that was like the lottery, uh, put stick a $20 bill in it and guaranteed we just hit three credit, three credit, like, ding, $600 cash out. We're done. Now yes. what do you want? Go First five dinner. minutes. Yeah. Yep. There's our rent. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah. I'm not a gambler. I like the free drinks. You know, you just play a little bit of blackjack and yeah. you know, that whole thing, but I don't even really do that anymore. So nickel slots. Yeah. yeah. We work too hard for our money in the creative arts. I totally agree. I totally agree. <laughs> and you know, when, when I was working at Harris, when I was doing the show, uh, they would give us free drink tickets to get us into the casino. And, you know, we would cash our check from the show and then, you know, give it right back to them. So, yeah. Where, when, when were you there? I was there in, uh, I, it, it's really funny because I was, I was doing that show after I had shot Metropolitan before it came out. And right. so I was actually in Tahoe on location doing this show when someone called me and said, Hey man, your, your picture's on the cover of the arts and leisure section of the New York times. Wow. And I said, why? <laughs> and they said, for this movie you did. And I was like, Oh my God. 
And that's, that's cool. That was Metropolitan, and that's what got the whole thing started. I hope you have that frame somewhere. That sounds. Uh, you know, I have it in a box in my garage, but. Uh, yes, I have that like in several locations too, like all these cool like tour posters yeah. and awards, and you you put them under the bed. Yeah. And then someday, like I'm gonna frame them all and put them yeah. somewhere. Yeah. Well, I I hope you get back to getting back out there soon, Rich. I'd I'd, I'd love to uh, come one night and. And yeah, here you can see you. So yeah, we usually play. You know, every couple of years, the Hollywood Bowl. Um, we always are always for sure in um, San Mateo, kind of really sure. where where Google is that that area up there, Mountain View. Yeah, yeah, that area. You have to love the Hollywood Bowl, no? I mean, isn't that the Hollywood Bowl was a that was a big bucket list for me to see all those Angelinos out there and the star shining and the Beatles played there and hendrix played there and i usually go there every fourth of july anyways to see the the fireworks, fireworks and yeah. cry and be all proud to be an american yeah um but i that didn't happen this year <laughs> oh it's closed completely closed right i know it's but so did crazy Rush play there that's the question that <laughs> everyone has played there yeah. so um how, how can people question. find you do you um, like to be found uh, sure yeah i do um instagram ctn7 okay. uh uh Twitter, Taylor underscore Nichols seven. Um, and then on Facebook, it's T T Nichols workshop nice. and on Facebook. And those are, those are probably the easiest ways. Uh, uh, and I, I love people reaching out and I like to reach out back and the whole thing. So, yeah. That is great, man. Well, congratulations on everything. And uh, everybody out there, look for Pen 15 seasons one and two on Hulu. I'm going to go devour them because the girlfriend and I, she's a fashion designer and she's not designing fashion right now. We're stuck at home. So, you know, we're, we're like binging everything. We started on Succession on HBO because yeah. it's so critically acclaimed and the acting is yeah. so incredible. Yeah, you have to watch Perry, Perry Mason also. You, That's you, coming up. You did that too, right? What is that? Really, really, a, really a fun show. HBO? Yeah. Matthew Reese is a star of that. And we were nice. talking earlier about, you know, when guys at the top are really cool. Welsh actor, by the way. Yeah. Uh, really, really great great guy great a great show really fun well man that is awesome moss is not growing on you man onward <laughs> and marching forward that's what we're going to do in 2021 is going to be a better year i know it let's hope let's hope let's, let's hope it starts on the third of november <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> incredible Both. incredible hey thank you so much for joining us my friend absolutely rich really nice to meet you and to talk jim wonderful to meet you jim Very thank you for your time and talent buddy and Likewise. uh Thanks to our sponsors, The School of Rock. We really didn't take a break, but hey, because the gym is magical, we'll get that ad in there for sure. Guys, thank you so much. Be sure to subscribe, share, rate, review. Keep coming back for the good stuff. See you soon. This has been The Rich Redmond Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredmond.com.